You know, uh, the world's not running out of oil. There's all kinds of oil left in all kinds of places. There's 165 billion barrels of the stuff in the Alberta tar sands. And if we run out of that, there's tar sands in the Orinoco. And there's oil five to 10 miles below the ocean floor in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Brazil. And if we run out of that, there's oil in shales in places like Wyoming and Colorado. So it's not about running out of oil. We're never going to run out of oil. But what the world is going to run out of, indeed, what the world has already ran out of, is the oil that you can afford to burn. Not just burning your cars, and 60% of all the oil that we consume is consumed in the form of either gasoline or diesel fuel to power those cars, but maybe more fundamentally, the ways that we burn oil in a million different degrees to which we're not aware of. But most fundamentally, the way we burn oil to run a global economy. And by a global economy, I mean where we produce something at one end of the world, ostensibly to take advantage of cheap labor costs to be sold at the other end of the world. Because while that model of the economy is based on wage arbitrage, it assumes implicitly and critically that the cost of moving goods and parts around the world is trivial or marginal at best. But no matter how we move goods around the world, whether we move them by air, whether we move them by boat, whether we move them by rail or by truck, we are burning oil. And soon, we will no longer be able to do that. Because the cost of raising 4 million barrels a day out of the Canadian tar sands, or the cost of replacing the rapidly depleting Middle East fields with deep water oil, the very prices that will be needed to get that oil out of the ground are the very same prices that will get you right off the road. And that is indeed a world of triple-digit oil prices. We saw a brief glimpse of triple-digit oil prices. And of course, people said that that was a fluke. Governments blame speculators. Speculators blame the US dollar. Oil companies blamed restrictive drilling conditions. But nobody wanted to acknowledge the inconvenient truth here. And the inconvenient truth here is that since 2005, conventional, i.e. the kind of supply that you can afford to burn, conventional oil supply has not grown. And it may never grow again. That doesn't mean to say that we can't bring new oil out of the ground. But remember one thing. You hear fancy gala press conferences by the Exxons and Chevrons of the world or by the Brazils of the world that they've just discovered these huge fields with billions of gallons of uh, barrels of oil trapped in them. But what you never hear about from these companies or these host countries is you see this field? It's been pumping for 50 years. We pumped her dry, and she's not going to yield any more oil. Yet, that very event, when you add up all of the fields that dry up every year, is worth 4 million barrels a day per year we lose to depletion. Just to put that number in some kind of context for you, we consume about 85 to 86 million barrels a day. So depletion is basically running at 5 to 6 percent. What does that mean? Well, that means that in the next five years, we have to find 20 million barrels a day of new production, just so that in 2014, we can consume the same 86 million barrels a day 
that we consume now. That leaves no allowance for any increase in world demand. There have only been two years since 1983 that world demand did not grow. 1983, following the double-dip recession, and last year, the deepest post-war recession on history. If we stay in recession, we have nothing to worry about. Oil demand will not grow for the next four to five years. But if we have an economic recovery of whatever shape, of whatever pace, we have a huge problem because it's not even clear that we'll be able to replace what we're about to lose, let alone make any net additions. And even if we are able to replace the roughly 20 million barrels a day that we will lose over the next five years to depletion, understand what we are losing and understand what we are replacing it with. What we are losing is the $3 a barrel cheap oil, the conventional stuff, the light Arab sweet crude that we've been pumping for the last 70 years. What we're going to replace it with is synthetic oil made out of Canadian oil sands. Look at the U.S. Department of Energy or the International Energy Agency, the two sort of official barrel counters, barrel predictors of the world. Look at where they're expecting the largest supply increases in the next 15 years. Not Saudi Arabia, not Russia, Canada. And of course, they're not talking conventional oil. They're talking synthetic oil. They're talking the Canadian oil sands from going from 1.2 million barrels a day to over 4 million barrels a day. It can be done. If Albertans want to t turn an area the size of the state of Florida into one giant tailing pond, it can be done. But even if they're so inclined to make that choice, the economics of that is going to require $200 a barrel oil. And $200 a barrel oil is going to translate into $7 a gallon gasoline. So we're going to basically be converting northern Alberta into a tailing pond so some schmo in Chicago can fill up at $7 a gallon in 2014 because, believe me, all of that increase in Canadian oil sand production isn't for people in Red Deer and Calgary. It's for the export sector. But even if that's the case, we're going to see oil prices continue to rise simply because the cost of bringing on new supply continues to grow. In economics, of course, higher prices ration demand. In the oil market, that doesn't seem to work. Because just as oil prices have gone from around $20 at the turn of the decade to as much as $147 a barrel just a couple of years ago, the world seemed to get thirstier and thirstier for oil. Why is it that higher oil prices boost demand when they're supposed, supposed to restrain demand? Well, the answer to that riddle depends very much on where you're looking at. And this also has huge implications because where you burn oil is where you find its carbon footprint. Oil demand has peaked in places like Canada, the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. The U.S. will never consume more than the 21 million barrels a day that it did three to four years ago. Right now, it's about 19 and a half million barrels. That's not where the demand for oil is going to be coming from, and that's not what drove oil up over $100 in the first place. Guess where you think the demand for oil is growing the most rapidly? Probably most of the folk here would say China, and certainly China's one of the strongest. But I know a place where the demand for oil grows even faster than China. Last year, OPEC, Mexico, and Russia consumed 14 million barrels a day of oil to China's. These countries also just happen to account for 65% of world oil production. These are the very countries where you've been told will supply you with your future oil needs. 
Saudi Arabia alone consumes two and a half million barrels of oil. What makes OPEC thirsty for its own fuel? Have you ever filled your tank up in Caracas or Rio? If you did, you'd soon know. It's 25 cents in Caracas. It's about 50 cents in Saudi Arabia. But the point is, it's 50 cents whether oil is $20 a barrel or whether oil is $200 a barrel because that's just the way things are over there. OPEC is a very disparate place, separated by history, religion, geography, but there's one common denominator. Everybody has a God-given right to consume as much cheap fuel as they bloody well feel like it. And that's just the way things are. And not to be too sanctimonious, here in Ontario, we have a God-given right to consume as much cheap electricity as we bloody well feel like it. And any provincial government that tries to discourage us from doing that is quickly showing the door. What's the difference? The difference is that here we are 90 miles away from the world's largest hydroelectric source, Niagara Falls. But you could understand how you, if you live 90 miles away from Gawar, the world's largest oil field, you might feel the same way about pump prices as we do about power prices. But if you think that 50 cents a gallon is a good deal, I know a way better deal in the Middle East. How do you think they generate power in the Middle East? They don't have coal. They don't have hydroelectric. We don't want them to have nuclear. So guess what they burn? They burn natural gas and oil. And guess what the cost of oil is to that uh, to that uh, electric plant in Saudi Arabia. It's not 50 cents a gallon, it's 7 cents a gallon. And that too is set by royal decree. Why are power rates growing at a multiple of those in North America and the Middle East? Key reason is, I mean I write about Ski Dubai in the book, but Ski Dubai is a head fake. The key reason is that the Middle East isn't running out of oil. They're running out of water. Places like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, they consume about 15 to 20 times replenishable water levels. Aquifers in Saudi Arabia are already 80% depleted, which is why they're now buying land in places like Pakistan and Sudan to grow food. They can't make the desert green because if they make the desert green, their people are going to be thirsty. Well, they may be running out of fresh water, but there's no shortage of salt, no shortage of salt water. And salt water plus oil equals fresh water through the wonders of desalination. Unfortunately, desalination is an extremely energy intensive process. Aside each new desalination plant in the Middle East is an oil power generating station with basically seven cents a gallon smoke going up its smokestack. Now, at the end of the day, this is their resource and they can do whatever they want with their resource. My point is only this. Stop thinking about what the Middle East is producing. Start focusing on what the Middle East and Venezuela is consuming because exports from OPEC are going to be steadily declining, not just because of depletion, but because every year more and more of that production gets cannibalized by domestic production. Instead of higher oil prices restraining oil demand, higher oil prices boost oil demand in oil producing countries because you just have that many more billions of petrol dollars chasing 50 cent a gallon gasoline and 7 cent a gallon diesel fuel. Now, of course, in the Indian Chinas, the question isn't about price subsidy. The question is about first time car drivers. And while the price of oil has gone up, that has limited tractions in people, among people who have no price memory. The big question there is the price of getting a car. Consider Tata's Nano. Tata's Nano is either a miracle or a nightmare, depending on your point of view. It's a car that you can now buy for $2,500. For literally millions of households in Southeast Asia, it's a miracle, allowing them access to roadways when they would never have that before. But in a world where gasoline supply has not grown in four years, on this side of the world, it's a nightmare because every Tata owner or every cherry owner in China gets a straw. 
a straw to start sucking at a world gasoline supply that has not grown for four years. So obviously, the more that they suck, the less that we suck, and the higher it costs for what we're able to slurp up. And that's why Americans don't get the fact that while some 50 million North Americans are likely to take the exit lane over the next 10 years, for every person who will get off the road in North America, there are 10 people who are willing to get on the road in other countries. A strong sale year for car sales in countries like Brazil, Russia, India is 30%. A, car, a strong year for car sales in North America is 2 to 3 percent. China has already surpassed the United States in car sales. China has already surpassed the United States in coal consumption. Soon the developing world will also surpass the developed world in oil consumption. And that's why, while triple-digit oil prices do restrain our demand, the demand for oil is alive and well in the rest of the world. And that's why we're going to see that we're going to have a rendezvous with triple-digit oil prices, not in 10 to 15 years. We're going to have a rendezvous with triple-digit oil prices in the next 10 to 15 months. And it's certainly not clear to me how this economy is going to behave any better than it did the last two years when we see those prices. It's fashionable in the world that I used to come from to think that the recent recession was all about subprime mortgages. Gee, I never knew that Cleveland was that big. I never knew that the U.S. subprime mortgage market was big enough to blow up the whole world economy. Blowing up Jeff Rubin's bonus at CIBC World Markets? Sure. Why the hell do you think I wrote a book? But blowing up an investment bank and blowing up global GDP are two different order of magnitudes. And here are my problems with the Cleveland hypothesis. Why was the recession in Japan twice as deep as in the U.S.? Why was the recession in Germany 50% deeper than in the U.S.? And why did Germany and Japan go into recession before even Cleveland went into recession if it was all about subprime mortgages? Maybe, just maybe, there was something bigger going on. Like, for example, the world's largest energy shock. If a pr energy shock, half of what the OPEC shocks were, the OPEC shocks both created deep recessions. This was even in inflation-adjusted terms double the size of that, why wouldn't, the, uh, why wouldn't the biggest shock of all be the obvious explanation for the po largest post-World uh, War II recession? Surely, surely knowing the nature of the disease is a precondition for finding the cure. We have gone billions of dollars into debt. We have gone billions of dollars into debt because we think the problem has been a liquidity problem and a financial market problem. We have even gone into billion dollars of debt to prop up industries like auto that will soon be made obsolete by triple digit oil prices. You can bail out Cleveland property owners. You can bail out money center banks. And you can bail out technologically obsolescent auto companies. But what you cannot do, neither the central bank nor the Department of Finance, is create BTUs of energy. And that's why we're going to run into the same challenges 12 to 15 months from now that we did two years ago. There's not a whole lot we can do about triple-digit oil prices, but there is much that we can do to immunize our economy from the impact of those prices. What we have to do is find out a way that peak oil does not translate into peak GDP. We don't have 15 years to wait for the development of alternative technologies. The solution right now is not to figure out how to turn cow dung into rocket fuel. The solution right now is on the demand side because we don't have the luxury of time for supply chain innovation. And the single most important way 
that we can make that adjustment on the demand side is to go from a global economy to a local economy because a global economy is an extraordinarily energy intensive and in particular oil intensive way of doing business. And I believe that that is exactly what is going to happen. Not because governments are going to mandate it to happen, but because the very same economic forces that paved over our farmland and created sprawling suburbs, the very same economic forces that gutted our manufacturing sectors and sent them overseas in the pursuit of cheap labor, those same very forces are going to bring those industries and those jobs back home. Take steel, for example, an industry that we've all but kissed off in North America. The days of China supplying North America with steel are numbered. Consider what China has to do to ship steel to North America. First, they have to schlep iron ore from Brazil across the Pacific Ocean, convert it into steel, which is in itself an extremely energy-intensive process, and then ship it back. Well, when oil got to $120 a barrel, all of those shipping charges added on another $90 to the cost of a ton of hot road steel. All of a sudden, the wage advantage on what is now as little as an hour and a half labor time to produce a ton of steel got eaten away by the $90 extra transport costs. In other words, what you saved on labor, you more than spent on bunker fuel. Just prior to the recession, Chinese steel exports to the U.S. had fallen 20 percent, U.S. steel production was up 20 percent, and the share price of U.S. steel had doubled. Had the recession not occurred, the next stage in that chapter would have been the United Steel Workers going on strike. And for the first time in 20 years, their employers would actually give a shit, because in the first time in 20 years, you could actually produce steel cheaper in North America than in China. That's steel. What about food? Last year, the United States imported $6 billion, everything from bok chow to frozen chicken wings from China. A whole new meaning on having your Chinese food delivered. Well, you know what? Steel does not have to be refrigerated. Food does. What do you think powers that refrigeration unit on the boat? The same thing that's powering the boat, bunker fuel. In a world of triple-digit oil prices, we will not be getting our food from China. What will we do? It's not like we're not going to eat. We're going to have to grow our own. The only problem is that half of our farmlands already paved over. In 1985, 40, over 45 percent of all the food in Ontario was growing right here. Today, less than 20 percent. That's going to change. That's not going to change because of philosophical choice. That's not going to change because of government policy. That's going to change simply because we will not be able to afford to fly in tangerines from Chile or avocado from Mexico in the middle of the winter. If we have to grow our own food, we have to change the nature of our land. And again, that's not by government fiat. That's by market forces. Will people still live in Stouffville and Newmarket and commute 50, 70, 80 kilometers a day on the 401 when gasoline is $2 a liter? I don't think so. I think those abandoned, those suburbs and far-flung exurbs will soon be abandoned. And what we'll see is falling real estate prices in the outer suburbs. Run the two lines plunging real estate values in the outer suburbs with soaring food prices, and all of a sudden, those unsold suburbs will be reconverted back to the farmland that they were 30 to 40 years ago. Now, up until now, I've just talked about the price of fuel, but there will be another price. Not only will it be beyond our grasp to burn fuel when it soon will be $200 a barrel, but we will also be putting a price on the cost of actually burning it. Carbon emissions are right now free and have been so throughout our industrialization. That is about to change. We are going to put a price on carbon emissions. And just as distance costing money will bring jobs home, putting a price on carbon emissions 
is also going to bring jobs home. In the past, raising the environmental bar in North America has been all about exporting jobs. It's been people in the service sector who wanted to make those kind of, of choices. People in the manufacturing and resource sector who have paid the cost. That's about to change. In the world that I see, Archie Bunker is about to get into bed with Al Gore. Because in the world that I see, raising the environmental bar is going to bring jobs home, not send them away. Since 2000, there have been huge reductions in the rate of carbon emissions from OECD countries. And yes, it is these OECD countries who bear the historic responsibility of what's in the atmosphere. Half of the carbon emitted from Charles Dickens' days is still in the atmosphere. And certainly the move from 280 parts per million to 390 parts per million is all about the emissions of Western Europe, North America, and the OECD. Unfortunately, the move from 390 parts per million to environmental tipping points like 450 parts per million won't be about us at all. It'll all be about the developing world. And to the biosphere, it doesn't matter whether the emission is coming from Shanghai or whether it's coming from Hamilton or Pittsburgh because there's no borders out there. The problem with Kyoto was it was not a plan to cap emissions. It was a plan to redistribute emissions because any time you regulate one part of the world and leave the other part unregulated, guess what's going to happen? All those industries are going to move from the regulated to the unregulated. The reason that China has already surpassed the United States in emissions, the reason that China's emissions have grown 120% in the last eight years compared to our emission growth, which is less than 5%, is not because they are any more efficient at emitting carbon. Quite the contrary. They are far less efficient than emitting carbon. It's because of the wage arbitrage. Because in a world where carbon emissions have no price, it doesn't matter how inefficient you are. All that matters is your, carbon practice, your wage practice. Well, consider steel again. North American steel manufacturers emit one-third less carbon than the same steel manufacturer in China. Again, if emissions cost nothing, who cares? What happens if emissions cost $60 a ton? If you have the economic advantage of producing less emissions, then you, including the United Steel workers, should be the ones arguing for the highest price on emissions. Because the higher the price that you put on carbon emissions, the greater is your economic advantage and the greater is the disadvantage of emitting. It's the same thing with any resource pollution that we don't cost. Take Canadian oil sands, one barrel of synthetic oil, 250 gallons of fresh water. But if fresh water carries no price, who cares? Certainly not the shareholders of Suncor. What happens if all of a sudden we put a $5 price per gallon on the water that you pollute? Then the next thing, that flows to the bottom line. Then the next thing, Suncor shareholders are asking management, why are you using 250 gallons of water? And the next thing, technological change occurs. And the next thing you know, they're not using 250 gallons of water. But unless we are willing to apply that carbon standard to the rest of the world, all we are doing is redistributing the carbon. And on our own producers, they lose twice. Because not only will we force them to pay a price for their emissions, as they should, but then they lose doubly because they cede market to share to those who don't play by the same rules. How can we have traction with other economies who don't want to put a price on carbon? We can't tell the Chinas and Indias not to build the 800 coal plants and double world coal, coal consumption because after all, they're only doing what we're doing. But what we can say is you will gain no economic advantage by using dirty carbon to access our markets. Emissions from China's export sector alone is greater than the emissions of any other country in the world beside the United States. What we have to be prepared to do is to apply carbon tariffs 
to countries that will sell us goods that will not play by the same carbon rules that we will insist our own producers play on. Of course, we cannot charge anyone a carbon tariff for carbon prices that our own producers do not pay. Uh, but when we do put a price on our own carbon emissions, and I believe that we are going to be putting a price on our carbon emissions very shortly, because when President Obama implements that, he will be raising the bar for his trading partners, whether they want the bar raised or not. When we do put a price on carbon emissions, that will be futile unless we protect that price with tariffs for those who are wish to access our own markets. And the higher that we put that price, then the more important the economic value is on carbon management. The reason that we emit less carbon per unit of GDP than in the Chinese economy is 80% of their power comes from coal. In this country, less than 10% does. So in the new economy that I see, not only will distance cost money, but carbon will cost money. And all of that will lead to a revitalization of a domestic market that has become all but forgotten in the onslaught of globalization of the last 15 to 20 years. Yes, there will be many things that we will have to give up. Virtually everything that we will produce at home, from steel to food to flat screen TVs, will cost us more than we, when we had access to cheap labor at the other side of the world. But I think we might just find on a lot of different respects, from the quality of our environment to the breadth of new jobs in the economy, that the new, smaller world that we're about to embrace may in many respects be a lot more livable than the bigger one we're about to leave behind. Thank you very much. Magic audio person, could you turn the mic on? Is it working? Thank you. Um, it's unfortunate you don't have any opinions. You tend to waffle around a little bit, but you know, I think we got a little something out of that. Uh, and I also want to thank you for the image of Archie Bunker and Al Gore in bed together, <laughs> seared into my mind. I will never get rid of it. Uh, we are now taking questions. We only have about 10 to 12 minutes to do that. Uh, and I'm going to start things off because I don't see a hand starting, but start thinking. Um, I want to know if you've taken into account the fact that uh, you talk about the China's insatiable demand for everything from you know, water desalination, everything that's going on, but they are also building clean technology at a rate that we're not seeing in North America. If I'm not mistaken, I think the world's largest solar farm is built close to the Great Wall of China. So how does that factor into things? You're right that, that probably a lot of the new green technology that will become key to the economy of 10 to 15 years from now is going to be developed right in places like China. China's hydrocarbon challenged, and it's certainly, it's certainly in their interest to develop that. But again, while that gets you know, the article in the New York Times, what doesn't get emphasized is 80% of China's power comes from coal. And yes, they are developing you know, some of the world's largest solar energy sites, but also between China and India, they have 800 coal plants on the board right now that they're going to build in the next five to 10 years because coal is, without question, the cheapest form of energy as long as emissions are free. You know, to, now, you know, to, to, I would argue it's the same thing as polluting water. Like water is cheap if it does, you don't have to pay for the water you pollute. Maybe water is not so cheap to Canadian oil sand operators if they had to pay for it. CO2 emissions right now are free. But, you know, let, let's understand that when we, let's take Ontario, for example, because, you know, not to be too holier than now, forget about China. You don't have to look at China. You can just look on the shores of Lake Erie right now, and we see the biggest coal belching source of CO2 emissions in all of North America. Why haven't we closed that sucker? Well, we haven't closed that sucker because if we do, the lights go out, okay? We don't have an extra three, 4,000 meg in the power system right now that we can close that plant. So we keep it open because it's, 
you know, it's, it's the economic thing to do. Would we make that same choice if we had to pay for the power of the electricity that we use from that power plant, $60 a ton for the carbon emissions that it spews out? I believe the market can take us to some very, very green places. You know, I mean, as much as I would want everyone in the world to buy my book since I get 450 a copy, the simple fact of the matter is that when oil's $200 a barrel and gasoline costs two bucks a liter or seven bucks a gallon in the States, people won't have to buy my book. They'll know exactly what to do. They'll get off the road. You know, the question will be, is there, will there be a bus to get on? Right now, there isn't a bus to get on, and I think that, you know, we're going to find that those billions of dollars that we just bailed out Detroit and Oshawa with, two to three years from now, we will decide that we could have better used them for urban, tra urban transit. But, you know, to get back to the coal question, I mean, the fact of the matter is, yeah, China's going to pioneer new, new technology, but in the here and now, they're getting 80% of their power from coal plants. And while they're talking about solar fields, they're building 800 coal plants. All right, I see we have a question over there. I think we'll get a mic over to you. Question, question about uh, how your proposition will affect Chimerica, the China-America relationship. Okay. Uh, how is this going to affect the China-America uh, relationship? And I think what that specifically means is, is China going to show up at every treasury auction to buy all the U.S. dollar debt, and uh, with a $2 trillion deficit, uh, there'll be no shortage of new product? No, they are not going to show up to buy the debt. First of all, let's understand why they've been showing up to buy the debt, because it's not because they have warm and fuzzy feelings towards U.S. taxpayers. They have been showing up to buy the debt because if they don't show up to buy the debt, the U.S. dollar is going to puke against the yuan. And up until now, China has perceived that much of the growth of its manufacturing sector has been about supply in Walmarts. As you may note, China is leading the United States in the economic recovery, and it ain't about supply in Walmart. It's about trade with its Asian neighbors and its own domestic market. When China figures out, forget about the carbon tariff, just the transport costs on $150 oil, when they figure out that at $150 oil they're not going to be supplying Walmart, there's going to be no reason to worry about the yuan appreciating against the U.S. dollar because the U.S. isn't going to be a major export market. And when we throw the carbon tariff on top of that, between the carbon tariff and $150 oil costs, you're basically looking at a 30-40% tariff rate. You'll probably be seeing as many Chinese goods in your supermarket or as your store as you would have seen 30 to 40 years ago because that's when the tariffs were equivalent to that. So they're not showing up at the Treasury auction because they don't care that the Chinese yuan will appreciate the 30 to 40 percent. So you know who's going to have to buy those bonds? You're going to have to buy those bonds. And I suspect that you'll be asking a little bit higher interest rate than the People's Bank of China has been asking for recently. So um, you're absolutely right if the gist of your question is, hey, uh, you know, if, uh, if we do this, then the Chinese aren't going to be funding our deficits. And I'm saying even if we don't do this, the Chinese aren't going to be funding our deficits because at $150 oil, they can't supply Walmart any, anyway, and they won't care about the yuan going up. Next question. Thank you. And in case you don't know, uh, the, the term of the U.S. dollar puking is a, a very specific financial term. Okay, our next question right over there. I think they get it. I think so. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. I'm Jeff Muzzerall, the director of the career department at the Robin School of Management. I have nine of our brightest and best MBA graduates heading out into a job market in 2010 that you said is the worst since the last war, or the last great war. You also mentioned putting a price on admissions will bring home the jobs. If you could play career counselor for a moment, where, what advice would you give to our MBA grads on how to take advantage and how to make a difference uh, given uh, the the Pico oil hypothesis. Okay, well, I mean, I, I think the key mantra of the local economy is going to be distance cost money. 
I mean, you know, everything from supply chains to where you advertise. So I think it's going to be re-engineering companies back into their own domestic market, or if not their own domestic market, their own regional market. It's not that China's not going to trade. China's going to trade with Taiwan, Japan, Indonesia, Korea, and we're going to trade with Mexico and the United States, but we're going to go back to regional. Beyond the MBA, let's just think about the changed nature of our economy and the changed nature of jobs. I mean, in the book, I refer to it as the barista economy, where everybody's basically, you know, serving cafe lattes at Starbucks because we don't make anything. This isn't made here. The food we eat doesn't, make, doesn't come from here. Nothing's made here, okay? Well, and that's why, you know, 75% of the economy is services and only 25% is goods. And most economists think that that is an irreversible trend. I think that trend reached its apex two years ago. I think the manufacturing sector and the agricultural sector, they're going to start to grow. And if we're going to start making our own steel, making our own flat screen TVs, growing our own food, not everybody can be serving cafe lattes at Starbucks. We're going to need people to actually work in these places. And skilled trades that had become virtually obsolete in our economy, because everybody's in the service sector, is going to be coming back, you know. And I also think that, you know, the whole repair industry, I mean, in a world of mass-produced cheap consumer goods where they come from cheap labor markets around the world, something breaks, toss her, you know, <laughs> because every year it now costs half of what it used to cost. That flat screen TV that used to be 4000 bucks, it's 1000 bucks. Guess what? If it's getting made in Kitchener, it's going back to four grand. And the next time it breaks, you're not going to toss her because you can't afford another four grand to buy a new one. You're going to have to fix it. So we're going to have to hire some TV repairman to fix it. And all of a sudden, the market for TV repairman is going to grow. And a few, a few baristas will be working in the electro home factory. So that's basically the way that I see the labor market sh uh, shaken out over the next 10 years. Next question. Okay, I think we have our last question. Here you go. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. My name's uh, Nikhil Lama, MBA student at the Rockman School of Management. Okay, I had one question. Your premise is that um, by applying a, a carbon tariff on products coming from China, we're going to f kind of force them to apply more green techniques or apply greener technology to produce their products. But I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering. I agree with you. I think that's a that's a great idea. But what about if that's too much of a disincentive for China to actually sell in the U.S. and it starts selling in its own domestic market? What incentive is there for them to still continue, you know, producing in using well, greener technology? Well, okay, I'm, I, I'm saying that we cannot tell China not to burn coal because they will point out that we industrialized from burning coal. And they will point out that, you know, 85% of the shkuns up there did not come from them. And that's totally true. It's the difference in mathematics between the integral and the first derivative. I'm sure that's very clear to people. <laughs> it's the area under the curve, all the accumulated emissions, with some tipping point, which is the rate of change. And as I said, to get the 390 parts per million, that's all about us. But going forward to 450, that's all about them. So if we care about environmental tipping points, we have to get them engaged and by more than moral suasion. Otherwise, there's no point in us doing anything because there's, no, you know, there's no borders up there in the biosphere. How do we get traction with them? I mean, they will call it eco-imperialism. And from a, a historical point of view, that's a legitimate thing to say. But again, the biosphere doesn't care about the source of the emissions. It only cares about critical tipping points. We have to get a price on emissions, okay? I would say that all those carbon spewing industries in China is a market failure. They're not there because they're the most efficient emitters of carbon. They're there because we haven't put a price on carbon emissions. Just like we don't put a price on the 250 gallons of fresh water that we pollute with every barrel synthetic oil. I suggest that if we did, the oil sand manufacturers would find a new way of doing business. I suggest that if we put a carbon tariff on countries like China and India, they will find, they will be incented to change their ways. 30% of the emissions from the Chinese economy is in the export sector. 
That's bigger than the total emissions of every other economy in the world except for the U.S. So you're right, we can't gain them traction on their own domestic economy, but we certainly can get their attention on exports. But before, before we can start charging anybody a countervailing tariff on their emissions, we got to start collecting on our emissions. But, you know, the thing that the U.S. steel industry and all the industries like U.S. steel got to figure out is in a world where we put a price on emissions and you are the more carbon efficient producer, that flows positively, not negatively to your bottom line, and that brings jobs home instead of sending them away. And indeed, you know, my, uh, my comment about Archie Bunker getting into bed with Al Gore, well, you know, it just so happens that my context for that was the Blue-Green Alliance between the U.S. steel workers and the Sierra Club. And people are already starting to figure that out, that blue-collar jobs can become green-collar jobs by raising the environmental standard we can actually bring jobs home instead of sending them away. Thanks very much.